<laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I, I did talk to Sue. I put an idea to Sue quite a long time ago about the idea of like a like carpool karaoke, but like <laughs> but like carpool property where everyone gets all in a car together and goes around to each other's sites and Fabulous. all it films it and chats about property right. for a few hours. We're now live on YouTube, guys. We're now live on YouTube, so I'll get us all going. Welcome everybody oh, oh out there alive. on the world of YouTube. Why don't we just get everybody oh. on because YouTube is just queuing everybody up for tonight's stellar panel with Linda Wright, the absolutely stunningly fabulous planning consultant extraordinaire, the super fantabulous Sam Norris, who is a finance creative expert that can pull rabbits out of hats that you didn't even know were there. And the Mr. Strategic, fantastic debating partner, Adam Lawrence. So welcome to the Great Property Meet, Adam. You eventually get here. We've hooked you in. Good evening and welcome everybody to the Great Property Meet, where we have an amazing, fantastic panel lined up for you tonight. We've got Adam Lawrence joining us from his virtual car, but the windows seem to go up and down in this virtual car that he's got on his Zoom meeting. We've got the fantabulous Sam Norris helping us with our creative finance raising exercises, and he's been doing this for a very long time. And we've got the superb, fantabulous, absolutely beautiful, gorgeous Linda Wright, who's going to blow us away with the planning expertise she's garnered over the last 30 years. So I'd like to firstly start by thanking uh, the sponsors to the Great Property Meet, property118.com, fantastic online resource, the best uh, property investor news magazine aimed at the strategic property investor, YPN, Your Property Network magazine, who focus on your property deals, Anjum Design, who are one of my power team, Newman Property Experts, uh, one of our local agent sponsors, uh, Blend Finance as well. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is welcome our illustrious panel. So give everybody a big wave to the audience, guys. Thank you. And Linda, a smile wouldn't go on me. So I think we're about to crack the, uh, the camera. But I think she's on mute as well. <laughs> I didn't I didn't get that abuse, Linda. I am, I am sorry. I said it's Monday for God's sake. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, for those people who don't know Linda, if you've not met Linda before, she's actually a stand-up comedian as well as a town planner. Now well, I'm expecting big that. things from Linda tonight because she always puts a smile on my face. And for those of you who remember Linda joining us at the Great Property Meet about two years ago, she met her fourth husband. Was it the fourth husband I think we met? Your third, darling. Third. Okay, sorry, Linda. We met Linda's third husband. He was going across the floor, rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. And I just happened to catch him and throw him away. So she never got that third husband, did we? So sorry, Linda. Sorry, my life. I've kissed a lot of toads. Yeah, <laughs> well, we've heard that one. So Sam, I, I've known Sam about, I think, seven years. And um, I came into contact with Sam through a, a very complex trust structure. And Sam is one of those brilliant minds that can actually raise money on things that other people go, no, you can't raise money on that. That's going to be impossible or difficult. Well, Sam can. So he's the can-do finance man in my book and he's somebody you need to put in your power team and Adam well I've known Adam I don't quite know how long I've known Adam but he's just one of those people that every time I listen to Adam my brain goes and fizzles because he comes out with a new curveball and I think wow he's just took it to another level again so I'm going to save the best till last and what I've decided is we're going to start with the brilliant Linda Wright first. Now, who is Linda? Well, she's had a 30 year in planning, both in the public sector and the private sector. I mean, she's just brilliant. She's a gamekeeper turned poacher. But thank goodness she didn't look like a poached egg today for us. 
I love Linda's real common sense approach to planning as well. I mean, she looks like a little puppy dog, but I tell you, I wouldn't like to be a planner because she's a real Rottweiler and she will grab you and uh, get what she wants. Nothing stands in Linda's way. And she runs a fantastic planning consultancy called Planet Right. Linda, has that earned me the 50 quid you bribed me with? Wow. It doesn't, I'm thinking, who the hell is he talking about? That's marvellous, <laughs> darling. Thank you. I was, well, I was looking behind me to see if somebody else had come on. Well, I, I was just hoping the chair would tip back for you. But... <laughs> <laughs> it, might, it might do later. It might do later. As it's a virtual background. Yeah, probably. It is. Well, tonight we're going to share with the audience how we, as experts, are going to bounce back in 2020. Now, what I'd like you to do out there on the YouTubes is to post your questions in the comments box below for the for our panel of experts. And what I'll be doing is posting those to the panel, posing those to the panel of experts to answer those after they've all given us a little insight into their take. Now, there's been a lot of videos going around. Hands up. I made a few where I was ethically advising people on bounce back loans on how to draw the funds down relevant for your business. Now, we're about to come out of lockdown. How are we going to prepare and do some smart things going forwards this year? Because potentially we've got a fall in knife. The market could just drop. So it's really important to add a lot of value to what we do. And that's why I feel Linda is the expert. Do you want to share with us some of the things that you think might be on people's agenda this this year? Mm. Um, I'll give it a go. Um, as, go Adam, it. as Adam froze, and oh no, he's he's, he's all right. He's he's, he's up again. Um, th there's a number of things here, really. It depends if you're a property investor developer. It it depends on what your strategy is, because everybody, you know, you go on a course, and somebody tells you to develop a strategy. And, and it drives me bonkers. So it depends on what your strategy is. If it's HMOs, fine, you'll do HMOs, and I'll talk a bit about HMOs. If it's um, office to residential conversions, fine, I'll talk a bit about that, and, and what's possibly gonna happen maybe this year, possibly next. Um, if you're looking for greenfield sites to develop, or you're looking for properties that have a big back garden, and you want to develop a you know block of flats or a single house on big back gardens lots of people have i'm not going to talk about service accommodation um because if you're doing service accommodation quite frankly you're on your own um nobody comes to me for planning permission for service accommodation because nobody gets planning permission for service accommodation but you need to be a bit careful with that um because i sense a, a, a change of direction with all of this. I don't know exactly what, but I, I sense that certainly the uh, local authorities in London are going to start making some fairly hard-nosed policies on the service accommodation side of things. Um, and then it's, are you a small developer? Are you looking for sites, brownfield sites, demolishing the building, building half a dozen houses, building 10 houses, building a block of flats? So every single element of planning will be different for each one of those strategies. So to say, well, what should I be doing, Linda, in planning? I don't know. Get me a crystal ball and I'll, you know, I'll tell you. Um, but the, the thing that you do need to know is we've, we've gone through 12 weeks of lockdown hell. I, it's made not much difference to me, quite frankly. I live alone. Um, I work alone. It's just meant to have work from home, which I, I did do for years instead of going into my office. No big change. I've been doing webinars, training. I've been training myself. I've been listening to barristers and, and, and solicitors and, and learning myself about what's going on. Now, let me tell you some of the stuff that have, I have learned. Don't think that we have to wait until lockdown. Everything is starting to move again. L nobody was getting mortgages, Sam will tell you about this because none of the surveyors were going out and doing the site visits. That's changing. 
So everything is starting to shift and move and we're all doing social distancing. I did my first site visit a couple of weeks ago. You know, the, the construction crew stayed away. We had hand sanitizers. I, I don't wear a mask. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just my thing. If I used public transport, I would. <sighs> Moi, public transport, darling. I don't think so. Um, so, and you have to now and they put it into legislation, but you no, know, it's wearing gloves. It, it, it just depresses the immune system. So just, just get on with it. If you're going to get it, you're going to get it. If you're not, you're not. Just move on. Um, so going out on site, lots of planners are not going out on site. However, I put a planning application um, in with Cheshire East only the other day um, for quite a, a big site and, and for uh, demolition. The planner contacted me very quickly and said, I'm going to do a site visit, but it's going to be unaccompanied. So you think, fine, do the unaccompanied, do a site visit. I'm just pleased you're going out there, you're looking at it, you're contacting me. Fabulous. Um, so don't think that because of this lockdown, everything has ground to a halt. Now, let me just say, some councils are better than others, as we know, because every single council will be different. We know there is no consistency across the board with planning. Every, every uh, council will interpret things differently. So if you are looking at HMOs, then if you're looking to buy HMOs, you need to be careful where you're buying because we all know um, Manchester and we know um, Bournemouth and Worcester and lots of places have citywide HMOs. Uh, a citywide Article 4 directions, which prevent you from doing an HMO, a changing a single dwelling house to an HMO under permitted development rights. You need to educate yourself about Article 4 directions if you, I'm probably teaching my grandmother to suck eggs with your lot, Andrew, but be very careful. Lots of councils now are doing more than one Article 4 direction for HMOs. When you put, when you're searching for these things and you put Article 4 direction in, you will invariably get a lot of conservation area Article 4 directions. Move past those and put HMO in there. You have to find out before you're sitting in that seat at the auction, being a motivated buyer, you need to know, you need to do your due diligence. That's the big thing in planning. It's not just about financials and legals, it's planning. You need to find out what issues there might be. Be careful of listed buildings as well because they're notoriously difficult, although not impossible. Now, if you're looking at permitted development rights, and I use the term loosely, you can do all sorts of things to a single dwelling house. You can put additions on. You can even do a neighbor notification process, which means you can put either a six meter or an eight meter single story rear extension on a property. A lot of people don't know about this. Surely that will increase your economic, your rental income from this property. And it's a simplified system. So have a look at that. If you're gonna be doing office to residential, somebody phoned me the other day and one, one of the, she was uh, investing in one of the London boroughs. And she said, well, why can't we find these offices, convert it, to use the uh, prior approval, uh, no, it was it wasn't offices. It was a D one. It was um it was a, a church. Why can't we convert it to offices and then use the prior approval system to go to residential? And you think, yeah, be a nice trick if you could do. It. I said no, the office. The, and you, if you're not writing things down, write this down now. Offices have to have been in use if you're going for the office to residential. They have to have been in use from 2013. So you can't do that. And equally, the B1A use class to C3 is just that, it's C3. It's not HMO. You can't go straight from offices to HMO. If you then get prior approval, which is what this procedure is called, it's a hybrid between permitted development rights and full planning. You don't have to pay section 106 agreement, legal agreement, you don't have to provide affordable housing. So if you're doing 100 flats, you don't have to do all sorts of things. And it's a simplified, but you have to get all of the little criteria right, the conditions right. So if you're doing an office to residential, 
um, and you went for C3 and got flats. And those flats are each three bedrooms, highly unlikely, but you never know. And you want to put an HMO into each one of those. You can't. You would have to submit a new planning application. Now, loads of people argue with me on this one and say, well, you don't know what you're talking about, Lindy. No, you don't. You, trust me, I've read the legislation. You cannot go from offices to HMO. You have to go from offices to C3 residential. If you want to then go and create cluster flats and HMOs, you then have to apply again and go for HMO. But you've then got the principle of residential established. So theoretically, depending on what council it is, it should be easier. Now, if you're looking at greenfield or brownfield option, brown, greenfield is still going to be difficult. Green, green belt and greenfield is still going to be sacrosanct. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, well, hang on a minute. Taylor Wimpy and Bovis Homes and all of those guys down the road have just built 300 houses on the green belt. Well, yes, they can, because quite honestly, they are helping the council in their local area with housing delivery. You building one house in Greenbelt back garden is not. So it's, it's, a, it's, oh, it's annoying and it's irritating and it's infuriating, but you simply can't. You cannot. I've, I've got round in the last, uh, it's 10 years now since I set up my, I was going to do, in March, I was going to do a whole big celebration and promo and look at me 10 years. <laughs> that fell flat, didn't it? Um, so if, <laughs> In, my, in the 10 years that I've, I've been in, in, in the planning private consultancy, I've got round the green belt legislation twice for somebody. And so that, tell, and it's not for want of trying. So that tells you that if you're gonna try and get around the green belt, mm, don't, um, unless you're Telewimpy or Bovis or whoever, Miller Holmes or whatever. Um, if you're gonna go for Brownfield, Whatever you do, do not go in and demolish the buildings, whatever you do. Um, if you are going to go for Bradford, you might be limited to the amount of space that is already on site, the brownfields that are there. If you demolish the buildings, you start from zero. So you may not get planning permission. So you really do have to leave the buildings on site and you do a quid pro quo and a bit extra. So whatever floor space you've got, you can replicate and then a bit more. You can squeeze squeeze a bit more juice out of it. Um, but it, it, it really does just depend on what you're doing. I do, uh, my, my lads who do the, the drawings because we do drawings as well, you don't need to get an architect. You do not need to pay architect's prices to, you know, look, if you're getting a property, you're gutting it, refurbing it, you're putting an ensuite in the living room to create an HMO, be still my heart. Um, you do not need a full blown architect. If you are building your dream house on a hill in the Lake District or in the Cotswolds, well, first of all, good luck with that. Um, but second, yes, you need an architect. You need the vision, the imagination, the construction knowledge. If all you're doing is gutting, refurbing and throwing tenants in, you really don't know that. My lads who are, are my associates, they are experts at splitting up existing buildings. They go in with their little gizmos, um, measure everything up. They put it all on, on um, AutoCAD and we end up with a building that not only get, we get planning permission with, but passes building regs as well. So we are, I hate the phrase cradle to grave, but you know, once we finish and got building regs, you can then move in, your contractors move in and build it. I've, there's a, a, one of my clients phoned me today. He's doing um, a pub into six flats in a in a, a Bolton Moors village. Um, an architect took that, I won't name it, an architect took that to planning the year before to get it converted to a single dwelling house, got it refused. Client came to me and said, I want to convert it to residential. I said, oh, well, uh, got the house refused. He said, I don't want a house, I want six flats. And I went, hmm. But we got it. We got planned admission, got it through, um, got um, a large HMO in, in one of the northern towns, town centre, because it's linked to a university. The um, clients had spoken to the student accommodation team 
And we got 11 rooms in this former offices. It had to be a full planning application and it was a bit squirrely at the planning committee, but it got through and then they promptly sold it. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, you know, once I've got your planning permission, it's none of my business what you do with the building. You, you can do what you want with it. You can demolish it, you can rent it out, you can sell it, do what you want. Um, so does, does that make sense? Now, let me just briefly, because Andrew was leaping in there, just briefly say there a paper came out. God, you, uh, you've got to feel sorry for central government. Not much, and certainly not for Boris Johnson. Anyhow, um, a paper came out in on 12th of March called Planning for the Future. Now, there's a massive amount of changes likely to come in for planning for the future. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm quite hot and I'm fiddling my, with my glasses because I've got a sweaty nose and my glasses are sliding down. I know that's a very attractive image for you, but you know, bear with me. So um, what is coming in, and it, it, it should have been spring, summer time, but that's not gonna happen because central government are a bit busy. Um, and it might not even be autumn time. It may even slip and slide into next year, but they're talking about new permitted development rights. Now, I, we don't quite know what those are, but one of the things that is bubbling under, and again, if you've got a pen and paper, write this down, is for office buildings um, to be demolished and rebuilt as residential flats. Not just converted, because quite honestly, some of the office buildings that I've seen, you know, the old, the old 60s, office buildings they're a bit daggy quite frankly if there's flats in there I wouldn't live in one some of them are a bit you know on the edge and they're in, in weird areas so what they're proposing and this has been on the on this is nothing new this has been on the cards for years but they are desperately trying to get through the possibility of demolishing office buildings and new build residential so that's one thing the other thing is air rights as they call it in the states lot of this stuff in Las Vegas and things and, and New York um but air rights is if you have one building that's say I don't know four stories another building that's four stories and in the middle you've got a two-story building there is a they're, they're calling it a permitted development right I think it'll be a prior approval like the office to residential scheme to go up a couple of stories to go to the same height as the building on either side now that is, that's, that's kind of a game changer really. Uh, and if they do it, it's not gonna be full permitted, but you are gonna to have to have a prior approval. But if you do a prior approval, then it means you've no, for the floor that you create, there's no section 106 agreement, there's no affordable housing requirement. You are sort of let off those things if they do it the same way as the prior approval. Just remember that although there is still prior approval to change light industrial. The, the office to residential is now a permanent right. So it's it's fixed. So if you get if you get a prior approval from the council for office to residential, it lasts for three years, just like a full planning application. There's no there's no long stop date. Um, with uh, there was storage and warehouse to residential that ended the 10th of June last year, they did not extend it. So if you are looking at a building where the seller says, oh, well, I've got planning permission for residential, that's fine. But whatever date that was approved, there is only three years on that. And that will then end. So if you don't do this and complete it, there is no possibility of going back into the council to get planning, to get prior approval again. It's finished, it's done. So warehousing and storage, but there is light industrial. You can go for light industrial to residential, but that is scheduled to end in October this year. Now, the fact is, the likelihood is that what's gonna happen is that is possibly gonna get extended, but it might not. They might do what they've done with the lighting, with the warehouse and storage, which is a different use class, they might do the same with the warehouse and storage and they might end that. So seriously, if you are looking at a light industrial that's had prior approval, 
a light industrial to residential, be very careful with the dates on these things because they might not still be in, in, in legislation at the end of this year. But there's, there's lots of stuff coming. There's lots of funding for big housing developments. Everybody says, oh, there's, there's lots of funding for housing. Well, no, it's not going to come down to you if you're saying, well, I'm creating a nine bed HMO, so I'm creating housing. No, you're creating rooms in a house or a building. And what they mean by funding for housing is large amounts of housing. It's not... It's not about um, you just doing one house here or there. There may be some available, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold your breath about it. So that's kind of a whirlwind. If I've missed anything, who's that? Are you on a sex chat line? Couldn't make it up, did you, Andrew? Right. So. Um, is there anything else that you think I've missed? We're, we're going to be doing this um, use classes order series, and I'll leave you to tell people about that because people get very confused about the use classes. So I thought we'd do a whole series on each individual use class and tell you what it's all about, what you can change to, what you can't change to, and what you should be looking out for. Because lots of people call me and say, oh, I phoned the council. I love it when people get on a high horse. You can hear them going clippity-clop, clippity-clop on the high horse. Well, I phoned the council and they, they, didn't, they wouldn't tell me. Well, they don't know. They, honestly, councils don't have resources to go around the high street and every building in the country looking at what the use class is. Use classes is whatever it was used as last. Not what it's had planning permission for, whatever it was used as last. And please, if I, if I had a pound for this, the number of people that say, well, on the estate agent's details, it says, what's the function of an estate agent? To sell. They're going to tell you whatever they think you want to hear. Please do not believe. It's, it's like, you know, estate agent's details. Yes, there are pixies and fairies and unicorns in there. Stop it. Find out. Do your due diligence. Don't be lazy buggers. Right, on that note, on, on the buggers note, I will stop because I'm sure I've done more than you wanted me to. You're on mute, Andrew. Mute. Mute. And mute. Ah. There you go. You've been absolutely perfect, Linda, and you've actually done. Was originally uh, anticipated. So brilliant stuff is all I can say. Now you're um, you, you've garnered a number of questions off the YouTube, which oh, we'll do within the Q and A session. And I'm going to go for a drink. <laughs> drink? What do you want? Well, I might disappear in a minute and go get a glass of wine. I'm drinking my tea at the moment. Carry on. Go for it. Put put yourself on mute and pause. No, then. no, no, you carry but, on. Um, no, that, that is brilliant. What you've done is just generated a load of questions, which I'm going to cover about your permitted developments, the NPPF 2020. Uh, there, there was one that came in for Erim. And before we get to the q and I'll do this one. He says, Linda, medical advice, please wear a mask. Or... Sorry, I misread that. He said, put a mask on because we'd prefer the look. How very dare. Right, that's it. I'm going for a drink. You can all bugger off. If you think I'm answering questions after that. Perfect. <laughs> I can see Adam's nearly falling out of his car door. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note... Now, don't, now, don't, well, don't get me started, you see, because... because uh, uh, We'll get onto this whole feminism, trans, and you know, as 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 a woman who doesn't menstruate anymore, ah, what do you call me? Oh, that's gross. All right, so I'm not getting in the whole Twitter. I know. See, look, Sam's got his head in his hands now. He's like, ah. Oh. 
Where's the lever for that chair? Shall we just pull the crank handle on it, guys? There you go. Linda, Linda I, I reckon we call you whatever you bloody tell us to call you. It's as simple as that. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, you see, Andrew got it wrong. I'm not the, I'm not a Rottweiler. I'm the planning pit bull, darling. Uh, well, I, I was being delightful for you. Being delightful. Wrong mutt. <laughs> Carry on. Well, I can see we've got quite a host of questions coming in here uh, on the YouTube. So if you've got questions on planning, you've got a project and you need some of Linda's advice, something Linda said there about PD rights, drop it in the box below and we'll get Linda answering those shortly when she's had a big glug of tea. But before we do that, what I'm going to do, I mean, Linda's giving you so much cannon fodder to get on with there, Sam. I mean, how do we uh, work that one out? Well, um, let, well let, my first thought was, how the bloody hell am I going to fo uh, follow that? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> With every extra minute that was going past, I was like, oh god, oh god, pressure, pressure, pressure. <laughs> plus, I've got, plus, I've got one of one of my cats is lingering around as well. And I was on, I did one of these a couple of weeks ago, and I got to a really sort of important, quite, you know, um, the, there was a lot of detail in what I was saying, and just as I was about to sort of launch into it, her sister, the other cat just decided to stroll along the screen and slap me in the face with her tail. So I'm really hoping to not get a repeat performance of that tonight, to be honest. Although she's looking at me, she's giving me, she's giving me evil. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to humiliate you at a moment's notice. Um, but yeah. Well, she's waiting hell, for you to go that. live. And once you're live, well, that's you're it. sitting there going, oh no, I'm in the hands of the cat tail. <laughs> I know, I know, but yeah. So, where where to, where to start in terms of? Uh, Sam, I mean, who is this Sam Norris fellow? Well, he's the son of a builder, and he's developed his own properties. So he's not somebody who just sits there in an ivory tower in a banking corridor, going, "Oh, those are the numbers, and this is how to do the deal." And today's a very special day for Sam. Now, if I could, I'd get him a cake. Because today he launched his very own brokerage. So this is his inaugural day's business. And he's here on the Great Property Meet to launch that with us. Now, before he launched this brokerage, he's been a mortgage broker for 13 years. I know, like Linda didn't look old enough to have been doing planning 30 years. Sam doesn't look old enough to have been doing mortgage broking for 13 years. So... How, where do I get these young looking guests? Now, he's a real expert at helping clients use finance as a tool to achieve their goals. Now, I know Sam has raised money on trust structures and all sorts of complicated structures. And if he can raise money on structures such as those, a plain vanilla buy to let or a HMO or an office to resi conversion should be fairly straightforward. But Linda's talking about some quite busy stuff. I mean, where do you see the market going and especially bounce back loans? Because the thing I keep getting asked, oh, I've got this bounce back loan. I'm going to use it as a deposit. Sam. Yeah, that's, do you know what? that's probably a good place to kick off, actually. Let's talk bounce back loans because like you, I am getting that question left, right and centre, to be honest with you. Um, the consensus from the market um, when it comes to mortgages, let's just let's, let's break things down. We're talking mortgages here, is that they, they can't be used as deposits. And some lenders have even come out and said that if you buy a property cash, they are unlikely to even refinance it further down the line because they are going to want to see proof of funds. Um, by the way, if you buy cash, um, the when you come to remortgage, chances are your lender will ask you to provide some kind of proof of funds of the original purchase. So with these bounce back loans, you are still going to get found out, for want of a better phrase, even if you buy cash and then you want to refinance out further down the line. So pretty much across the board, we're getting told no. Even when it comes to bridging and developing and, and stuff like that, that kind of finance, the, the main consensus again has been these loans, these bounce back loans are not you know, the government is telling us they're not to, to be used to purchase assets of which property is, is one of those. However, um, I was actually on a call recently with one such uh, development lender who said, 
in certain circumstances, they would actually look into this. Um, and those circumstances were that if it was actually a prop co, so a property company that was actually taking out bounce back loans, obviously um, their business is buying and selling or developing property. Therefore, adding an asset or adding a new development is part of their, you know, their strategy, their business strategy. And so they would potentially look at using bounce back loans, not necessarily for the deposit, but they could look into that covering the cost of works. I've since spoken to other development funders and they have suggested the same. This kind of leads on to a, a slightly different point when it comes to bridging and development. Um, there has been a massive, massive difference over the course of the lockdown between um, the bridging and development part of the, the, the market and the mainstream, well, I say mainstream, the mortgage market, that's anything from your Barclays all the way up to, you know, your most, your smallest um, local little lenders that still will have banking licenses and, and lend mortgages. Um, the bridging and development um, side of things have actually been surprisingly risk averse. Um, the, this is a section of the market that typically, um, you know, they've been called cowboys in the past for, for some of the stuff that they're, they're happy to do. Um, some rightly, some wrongly. Um, but they've been massively conservative. Um, they've been certainly we've seen on the development side, a big, big sort of pull back on the sort of maximum loan to GDV, which is where we have to start in terms of figuring out how these development loans are going to be worked out. Typically, at the moment, I'm telling uh, clients, we need to be trying to work out whether we can actually get this deal done based on a uh, you know a loan to GDV of 55 to 60 percent, something like that. Um, now, there's pros and cons to this. Um, the cons are certainly that there are going to be some deals that some people can't do, because some developers can't do because they just don't have the money. Um, there are ways around that. We can look at things like deal stacking. We can get mezzanine funding involved. We can even get crowdfunding involved, potentially, so equity-based funding um, to, to stack this up. So we can be a little bit, we can think outside the box. But typically, when we're talking about senior debts, that's first charge debt, 55 to 60%. Now, for me, and this might come as a massive surprise because the more money I raise, the more I get paid, essentially, um, I'm a big advocate of not overstretching yourself at all. And I always try and push my clients on the side of caution, if I can, so the lower loan to GDV that they're raising, the better the profit margin is likely to be because the cost of funds is going to be lower because they're actually spending less on taking out those funds. Um, and there's a greater contingency in, the, in, in there just in case something does go wrong. Um, and really, it's this contingency um, that's, caught, that's forcing, well, pushing lenders, development finance lenders into doing this kind of strategy into, into de-risking themselves in this way. Um, and it's because they are worried that we're heading for a dip. You know, property values are going to be going down at some point. Uh, you know, I've, I've already seen at the top end of the market, um, I saw a down valuation not that long ago of a, we, what was a purchase of 3.1, I think, that went down to 2.6. Um, which was a you know which actually wasn't enough to stop the deal from going ahead, thankfully. Um, but it's at this you know higher end of the market that we're going to see this this dip. I think really really take effect. But no one's really knowing when this dip is likely to happen. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing coming out of the uh, the news at the moment is relatively positive. Transition levels up. Um, you know, lending levels up, all this kind of stuff. So it leads me to believe, when's this dip actually going to happen? Um, and maybe it might not happen, which would be absolutely fantastic. But development finance lenders are erring on the side of caution. They're expecting this dip to occur at some point. And so they're thinking, OK, well, if the GDV is going to be, they're thinking it's going to be there. If we lent at 70% GDV, which some lenders used to do, then that doesn't leave too much room and suddenly our risk uh, sorry suddenly our loan is at risk um, because the second part of it as well of course is exit strategy how are we going to get our money back now if they're selling great okay that that sort of difference of, of about sort of 10 to 15 20 percent in terms of the loan to GDV um, is not going to make too much of a difference if they're selling they're still going to get their money back to be honest with you it's when they're looking to refinance and we did see over the last 18 months well I certainly have 
and um, potentially Adam might confirm this as well, quite a, a bit of a shift where people are, are going from this sort of build to sell model to more of a build to rent model. Um, and so we've, well, I've certainly seen a lot of, of, of clients come to me and asking me advice on, on how to do this and how to structure this. Um, and there's, I mean, there's, there's kind of two main ways to do it. One is that you um, get a, an exit loan for the entire block, a multi-unit block, maybe a commercial loan, something like that. Or we split up the titles and the leases and we create individual mortgages on, on each and every one of them. Now, development lenders are concerned about this um, because number one, they're worried about loan to values being reduced across the board on the mortgage side. Um, typically, really, 75% is kind of the maximum at the moment. We go back pre-lockdown, we were getting 85% loan to value buy to let mortgages, which is, you know, which is pretty crazy. Um, now, now I think there's only one or two lenders that will go to 80%. But these aren't the lenders we're going to go to. I think one of them is Virgin. Okay, Virgin are not going to be lending on these types of properties um, that have just been built. These are these are sort of for for those that maybe have inherited a property and they're just going to rent it out short term. Just want to pull as much money out as possible because you know they've got to be they've got to pay inheritance tax bills or something like that. Um, so realistically, we're at seventy five percent, and that's at best. You know, so the, the best lending at the, in the market is still probably around the 65, 70 percent mark, although that is changing pretty much daily, um, which is obviously which is good news. But 75 percent really is, is, is where we're at. Um, there are still lenders that haven't come back into the market. There are still lenders that are being very inflexible when it comes to their criteria. Um, and this, again, is where development funders and bridging funders are getting a little bit spooked because it used to be a case that they would pretty much, um, especially when we're talking about here, the non-regulated loans, okay? So they're not regular, regulated by the FCA. They're regulated by a separate body, but they're not regular, but they're regulated by the FCA. And so they don't have to put as much due diligence into the exit strategy if the exit is a mortgage. Um, and they were comfortable with that before because there was just so many options. We've got more lenders in this country than the rest of Europe combined. So there was so many options available in terms of in terms of lenders. Now the market's changed a little bit. These development funders are going, ah, hang on a second. We need to look into this a little bit more because we need to we need to cover ourselves. And they're pushing back on us brokers to say, you know, we really want you to go to town on your develop uh, your uh, you know the exit strategy, and we need you to prove that this is possible. Now I'm really happy because this is something that I've been pushing for years and years and years. Um, that we start with the exit strategy when we're looking at development fin finance and bridging finance, and we work up work our way backwards. Unfortunately, I seem to be in the minority when it comes to working deals out in this way. Um, and it is causing a few concerns um, from the sort of more specialist part of the market. So lenders are looking for decision in principles now. Um, whether or not you know criteria changes in the next few months or so, they're still looking for us to actually get decision in principles and prove to them that lenders are available for this particular scenario, for this particular client. Um, you mentioned different structures of ownership, Andrew, you know, they want to know that lending is available for, you know, trusts held in the Isle of Man or, you know, companies registered in the Channel Islands, which is, um, and actually, I said that on purpose, because I have actually done a deal once where it was a property owned by a company in the Channel Islands that was um, held in trust in the Isle of Man. Um, and then it was rent and then it was rented back to the original UBO as well. So that was a tricky one. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and actually, we were raising funds on that to de-envelope the whole thing. So don't bother doing that. It's a complete waste of time. Um, so they want to know that there is funding available because, as, as I said, it's, it's kind of pulling in. Um, but on the whole, things are actually looking pretty decent at the moment, if I'm honest. Um, we had a bit of a dark period. I'm telling everyone from a lending perspective. I see the lockdown period as kind of split into three sections. Um, and, and the first section was suddenly lockdown occurred and the whole market just went and just stopped basically. Um, I was inundated um, with calls from clients, especially both those clients that we had applications underway, um, some of which lenders pulled out of deals. Um, and I, can, I can't tell you the amount of stress that I was under for the first sort of six weeks of, of lockdown. Um, 14 hour days was when I had a lion. Um, so it was very, very stressful. The, the, the market was kind of in a bit, a bit of turmoil. Um, we had big players 
pulling out the market. We had Together pulling out. We had Roma pulling out on the lending on the mortgage side. We had to, um, we had Kent Reliance pulling out, Precise pulling out, um, Fleet pulling out. We had loads and loads of lenders pulling out the market completely. Um, and and the, what, those that didn't pull out completely were pulling certain products. You know, SA service accommodation pretty much went overnight. Um, our fa- you know the most favoured lenders in particular for these sorts of strategies were just dropping these short-term let products, you know, like you wouldn't believe, um, which certainly didn't help that part of the market because they've been in turmoil pretty much this entire time. Um, so we had this cut that section, you know, where, where everything was just all over the place. Then we had this sort of lull in the middle where everyone kind of went, okay, so what are we going to do now? We saw lenders start coming back into the market at really low loan to value, 60%. Um, we even saw some start doing desktop valuations that never would have even dreamed of doing them before. And just so you know, a desktop valuation is not the same as an automatic valuation. There is a physical surveyor actually sitting at a desk doing stuff. Um, so it, it's a bit better than an automatic uh, or an automated valuation. Um, and yeah, we, we were starting to make progress. I certainly was starting to see inquiries come back in um, and we were doing some deals. We were getting some applications in and it was good. Then we had that momentous moment where um, Mr. Johnson announced that the, it was almost like you can imagine him with a big sort of ribbon and he's got a massive pair of gold scissors going, I now declare the property market open. And suddenly, you know, I was, again, the phone just wouldn't stop ringing and I was getting calls, right, the property market's back open. Let's get this back on the road. And I had, whoa, whoa, hang on a second. Look, at that time when that happened, um, I looked it up there was something close to 82 billion pounds worth of finance transactions that were in transit. They were in application stage that had been put on hold. Okay. That's a lot of money. (laughs) So we had to find a way of sort of getting rid of that bottleneck to start with. So we then had a period of time where we were, we were really getting told, look, applications, double the turnaround time, surveys, double the turnaround time. And we were starting to see that, to be quite honest with you. Um, had some very frustrated clients over that period of time, quite justifiably. And, but we, we're working through it, working through it. So we're coming out, I think, of that part now where things are starting to return to an element of normality. Um, and look, I think there's a lot to be really, really positive about. Um, as I said before, we've got more lenders in this country than the rest of Europe combined. So that gives us options. We've also got more liquidity than I think we've ever had in our history as a, com- as a country. Um, somebody might want to pipe up on the YouTube questions and, uh, and confirm whether I'm right on that or not, or, or, or at least dispute it. Um, but we've got a lot of liquidity. And that's why this recession is not going to be as bad as the, as the one that we saw during the credit crunch, because we can, we can borrow our way out of it, basically. <laughs> but, um, but lenders want to lend. And they're really desperate to lend. Um, Some are restricted by certain funding lines and credit lines that they've got. um, And so are taking their time to come back into the market. Certainly a couple of my really favorite bridging lenders just haven't quite managed to get themselves back in the market yet, which is disappointing for me. But I know that they're working on it. And what's really, really happy, uh, which sort of made me really happy during this period is actually, I think probably bar a couple of uh, bad apples, on the whole, the market has acted quite responsibly. Um, I think banks, lenders, they usually get a really bad rep. Um, you know, I even had some clients, when, when one, of the, one of my lenders pulled out of the market towards the beginning of this, one of the clients said, oh, they're just doing this to piss everyone off. I said, I guarantee you that's not the reason they're doing this. Um, they're doing this because they're inundated with, with new inquiries. They don't know how to service um, the applications and they furloughed 87% of their staff. So all their underwriters are currently on the phones sorting out mortgage holidays for everyone and don't even get get started on that. I'll leave that to the the side for the time being. So um, lenders have come back to the market when they feel that they can. They've innovated. um, And I was talking to um, one bridging lender towards sort of the middle of this um, who went out of the market. And funnily enough, they they actually had to go out of the market because one of their rivals went out of the market first and they had to deal with all of their applications and just couldn't handle it. So instead of giving bad service, they pulled themselves out. They took time to, you know, get the the applications that are already underway through. 
you know, so, so basically they said, we're actually going to look after our current clients rather than look after new clients, which I think is a really responsible thing to do. And they only came back when they were able to facilitate desktop valuations that would allow them to actually go all the way through. Some lenders were saying that we'll, set, we'll still take new applications and we'll go all the way through to offer and we'll do an offer subject to valuation, but we can't complete until we have a valuation. A lot of lenders didn't want to do that. Um, but we are now in a position, I think, where, as I said, there is liquidity. There's a lot of want and need in the market to lend. Um, as we've seen, transaction levels have gone up pretty high. And I think there's a lot of people that have been sitting on their hands ready and waiting throughout this uh, lockdown period that are now absolutely ready to go. And certainly in terms of my own experience over the last couple of weeks, I probably had more new inquiries from existing clients over the last two weeks than I have at any other two week period, probably in the last 18 months. So that says to me that a lot of people were ready and waiting to go um, and they're getting back in touch and, uh, and, they're, and they're going for it. So for me, the future looks bright and um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm feeling positive about things. So now Adam's going to rebut everything that I've said and, uh, and tell me I'm completely wrong. <laughs> well, I was, was going to say, Sam, you, you've certainly given us a lot to think about there. I mean... For the inaugural day of launching your new brokerage, I forgot to ask the important question. What's the name? And uh, I've been trying to keep this under wraps because I need. I was trying to, uh, yeah. We, we, we chose a name, uh, me and my business partner, that represents uh, our new geographical locations. Because for those that don't know, I, I moved from London to the West Midlands. And as I look out my window right here, um, I can see a very famous body of water that connects London to the West Midlands. So I'm not going to tell you what it's called, but that is a clue as to what it's called. Well, <laughs> I, I, I tell you what, uh, and th this will come a bit later. I'll uh, update people on a few things that are coming and, and happening. Uh, but we'll release that one again very soon, won't we, on another video? Yeah, we will. Look, I've, I've not, not been too cryptic. I'm going through a bit of a sort of transition period at the moment. And so for me, I'm just sort of servicing current clients and, and any kind of new inquiries that come in. Uh, but we are looking to do a nice, big, juicy launch. Hopefully, Linda, with a glass of wine or something sparkly in our hands um, sometime in sort of maybe October time once all the pubs and stuff are open. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting times. That sounds good to me. I, I'll, I'll bring a bottle. Of <laughs> You're all invited. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I know you've raised a really interesting point about the lenders are expecting a dip happening. And I'm interested to hear Adam's views on that. I mean, I, I've got so my I. Views <laughs> and I, I, I sort of liken it to like a bit of a skipping rope and you're going like this at one end and the rope's going in a wave because of various things, VAT, income tax, uh, but not furlough, bounce back loan, payment started. So there's lots of different little blips that are going to happen along this route. So for me, I'm looking at this and saying to myself, I expect um, there to be a wave. But don't take my view when we've got the expert on the panel with us. Let's have a listen to what Adam's got to say. Now, Adam, I mean, how can I introduce Adam? I mean, he's my favourite property debating partner. I mean, we've been on more panels debating and I always take the commercial. He always takes the residential. And I think Adam overall wins, but I get the swing vote of converting people from residential to commercial. So it's an interesting debating partner to have um he's co-founder of partners in property i mean wow isn't that a phenomenal network that you've set up and spun off and it's grown like like a bushfire really has taken off and and i applaud you and respect you for that adam brilliant work you're a prolific network and not just in your own partners in property but i can't turn youtube on without seeing you here there, 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 there. You're always somewhere. If it's not 9 a.m. on a Sunday doing a, a Piot and Jay and um, Ross webinar, it, it's somebody else. 
where do you find time? Because you've got five letting and estate agencies that you run as well and a portfolio of over 200 properties. And the thing I, I love about you is you don't just go, oh, I'll have one of them, one of them, one of them. You can buy properties with 78% proven discount off market value. I'm right there at 78%. Is that right? I think I think we achieved seventy three percent of value over the over the last hundred that I uh, that I assessed when we did the exercise, Andrew. So yeah, yeah. I mean you, you're buying at a seventy eight percent discount to the market now. If that's not good, I mean Adam's got an MBA and he's one of the smartest cookies I know. He, he's a I'd call him a rocket scientist of property. So <laughs> with that. Whilst he's in, in the cockpit of the, the rocket, if you've got questions for Sam on finance, drop them below because the, there's been questions coming in and I'll make a note of those. And when Adam's finished, I'll start posing those to the panel. But can we give a massive round of applause to the phenomenal Adam Lawrence, the rocket scientist of property, before he jets off into orbit in that space shuttle he's in? <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew. That's why I've got the roof open, so the ejector seat is ready to go. Um, I think, I think, in many ways, the both the excellent presentations that have gone before me have made it quite easy, which is nice. And I thank you very much for that, both, um, because you've covered an awful lot of the ground. And I can just bring a few things to tie those together. I think. I think I, I really like Sam's point about the sort of tripartite phase of of the lockdown, and I think. We could probably expand that to how lenders have felt, how valuers have felt, how investors have felt, how developers have felt throughout. And I think if you'd polled um, people on the 28th of March, let's say, then they would have said, I 20 percent down minimum. There were articles coming out saying Knight Frank are predicting a 40 percent drop in the market and things like this. And it really was or the nut low of the. The real, the real nadir of what we were feeling, it was just right. Now, and not a transaction had taken place. Uh, and it was impossible for transactions to take place, as Sam said. And that sort of operational blocker was a really interesting thing because we've never really coped with, with that before at all. And it obviously went on for a, a relatively extended period. And then as time went on, it started to ease a bit. And you could just feel, you could take the temperature and people were suddenly saying, well, I think 10% down might be sort of where it goes to. And then people started quoting figures like in 2008, it went down 13%. And then this happened in London and this happened in Stoke-on-Trent and this happened in South Wales and all the rest of it. And then time's gone on and then there's been more stimulus. So we've referred a bit to the bounce back loans. I know, Andrew, you've done some excellent videos on the bounce back loans um, and I seem to recall when I saw the bounce back loan scheme announced that the government expected to extend about 1.25 billion of bounce back loans to small businesses. And those who know, know that the, um, the coronavirus uh, business interruption loan scheme, the C-bills, was notoriously difficult to apply for. So all you heard from people was, oh, it's, I've been quoted 14% by Barclays or this has happened or that's happened. I've been banking with them for 10 years. I can't get a loan of this sort of size. And we were looking at countries like Germany and Switzerland who got money out quickly to their small businesses in, in some envy. But thankfully, we did sort it out in the end and we got the bounce back scheme underway. Now, from that 1.25 billion that I saw quoted, I think the figure today stands about 22 billion. So it's fair to say we've somewhat overshot the mark a little bit. And it, I'm, I'm hearing anecdotal conversations amongst people. It, it's a bit like top trumps, really. How many bounce back loans have you got? Well, I've got three on this business and I can get another one against this one. And well, I've got four and I've got it. And it's all very interesting, but it seems to have filtered through a lot of it into trying to buy property, as Sam said. And I'm sure there'll be people plowing ahead with cash, not expecting a pushback when, um, when they get to refinance. But of course, the thing is, it, it's the the entry level was you have a limited company incorporated before the 1st of March 2020. So if you'd incorporated your new shiny property company on the 28th of February, you'd have been eligible for a £50,000 bounce back loan on the basis that you'd projected yourself 
that your turnover was over 200K. But then the reality of it is you would go to someone like Sam and say, hi, Sam, here I am, new to the market, but I've got 50 grand. That's a funny sum to have. That seems awfully convenient. Yes, well, well, I got it from this bounce back loan. Right, okay, well, the lenders might want to know something about that. Whereas if you've got an established property company, the reality, you're probably spending these sorts of sums of money or your established developer. You're spending these sorts of money on on planning fees. You're spending these sorts of money on, on site work. You're spending these sorts of money on refurbishments. So this 50,000 or that 50,000 or the other 50,000, it's all, it all very much sort of intermingles. And what I've seen, because I look a lot at the auction market, because we procure a lot through auction, is very buoyant, buoyant auction market, but primarily because there's been a big difference between demand and supply. And the supply just hasn't really been there. And the auction is, a lot of people can look at an auction and think, oh, well, it's just one day, isn't it? It's a bit of fun in the evening. Um, your average auction, you go in and you'd say about a third of the people are there just to watch. The other third are representing the vendors. Uh, they're the ones crossing their fingers and their legs and everything else that, while watching everything that's going on. And about a third are there with an, in, with an intention of bidding, sometimes less. Sometimes only 10% of the room, to my estimation, is there with a serious um, intention to bid for, for properties that are there. And, you know, I've seen auctions that would normally have 70, 80 lots have seven or four or eight. And, of course, with this massive drop in supply, it takes six weeks to set up a proper auction. You have to build a book. You know, the, the, the way the 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 offline auction world works is there's all this hard work. There's your regular clientele that will give you stock that will put stuff out there for you. Asset managers, housing associations, receivers, all that banks directly, all that sort of thing. Um, and that, that, that whole thing has also has just stopped. And of course, one of the big motivators for getting stuff into auction, why do people want quick sales? Well, the old death debt divorce um, and debt whilst it's spiraling up at a, national level at quite a rate at the moment um at the personal level it hasn't been being pressed uh, at all really people like nationwide have come out and said look 12 months we're not going to be repossessing anything for 12 months there's a 12 month pass and i know sam skated over the mortgage holidays which i think is a good idea um and i'm, I'm going to give it the swerve as well um but the thing is some people thought it was a good idea to build up further cash funds which from a, a solely in isolation, it wasn't necessarily a bad idea. Um, but in the round, knowing how lenders behave, it's probably one of the more silly things you could do, realistically. But if people have taken holidays to hoard cash, if people have taken bounce back loans, if they've taken all of this stuff, this, this money is finding its way into the investment market and this money is finding its way into the auctions. So if we go back to Sam's analogy of the sort of three phases and, and everybody's um, perceived values, I think we could go to probably a week or two after he described Boris and his golden scissors or whatever, cutting the ribbon. If we went back to a week or two after that point, there were agents going, oh, I've never had it so good. I can't believe how many houses I'm selling. We've listed more houses than you've ever seen. And it's kind of like, well, we have been sort of closed for 10 weeks, guys. So you would you would expect there to be some latent demand, you know, but, but this wave is carrying on. And we probably shouldn't forget when we hit lockdown, we were in a Boris bounce. You know, we'd had a feel good that we hadn't had in the country realistically since the referendum. So lots of stock that had been holding off the market for years had started to come through. And that, and that was cut off in its prime because I think that probably had six months to run and it got cut off sort of mid-late February, realistically. Um, so maybe some of that's picked back up then, all of that latent demand as well. All of this speaks to a seller's market. Um, and things achieving prices that maybe they shouldn't. And the big, 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 big question, and it's a huge question, is what will the unemployment do to the market? Because the government has stepped in with a shotgun. They've absolutely sprayed buckshot everywhere. Some, If you're lucky, you've caught a bit of it or a lot of it. If you're unlucky, you've fallen through the cracks. That's the nature of the beast. It hasn't been a surgical arrangement. It's been they've tried to do what they can. And to be fair, fiscally wise, they should generally be praised, I think. There'll always be people who've got hard luck stories, and I, I sympathise with them. But generally speaking, I think they've done very, very well. Um, so with all that out there, with all of that going on, and with the transactions now trying desperately hard, as Sam said, 82 billion quid's worth of stuff 
in the pipeline trying to transact. We haven't seen people pulling out of stuff. We've seen people generally trying to complete. Yes, of course, we've seen the odd, uh, the, the odd opportunist, let's say, coming in and saying, look, we need to knock 20% off here. But the problem is there's three other people knocking on the door saying, well, we'll just pay the asking price because we were quite happy with the asking price. But unemployment is known to be a gigantic factor in the house price market. Now I've sit now, and this is where it gets more complicated, I'm afraid. So I, I love the rocket scientist analogy. I'm never going to be able to live up for it. I wasn't even that good at physics. So I'm pretty sure I couldn't be a rocket scientist, but I do, I do think it's important to understand what you won't be able to do here is look at a graph of 2008 or a graph of 1990 or 1929 to 1932. It's not going to help you that much because there are big differences. And in those three specific situations that I mentioned, there was a huge credit bubble. And people forget that. In the Great Depression, the credit bubble was in the stock market. So in those days, you could borrow 90 pence for every 10 pence you had to invest in shares. So you were buying shares at 90% LTV. Now, bear in mind, companies already have debt on their books, so they were already geared. So imagine these days, we can't even get our head around that sort of thing happening. 2007, you would be able to buy a house if you could find the right deal, buy it for 70 grand, day one, pull out 95. Simple as that. Before you'd done any work, before you found a tenant, all this sort of stuff. And these, these credit bubbles, this is not where we were in February or March this year. Now, then you start thinking about, well, unemployment's going to hit, and insert your number here, but most of the forecasts say between 8 and 12%. My Certainly my gut feel early on has been we would see double figure unemployment. It, it would be in that sort of 10, 11% region. Obviously, that was before furlough. We've got a lot of people on furlough, but I think we all could probably accept that lots of those people are already either at risk in a redundancy consultation process, or they're going to be at risk very soon. So it's currently, I think, 9.4 million people on furlough. There was a big rush near the end because the government said, if you're not on furlough by the 10th of June, then you won't be able to furlough these staff. So employers were like, get them on furlough, and then we'll see what happens. And the, the one of the downsides of that is, as Sam alluded to the, uh, the number of people that the banks had on furlough, is that it's enabled them to stay out of the market somewhat as well. So I think I think there's a few lenders I would call out and say, look, you're sitting on the sidelines here on the government's dime waiting to see what happens. Now, I'm not saying that's bad business sense because I think it's probably quite clever, but I don't think it helps the economy very much. And I don't think it helps. I don't think it helps Sam do his job either. And I don't think it helps me do my job, which is why I'm moaning about it, quite frankly. Um, but it's not as simple as looking at our oh, so when was the last time we remember massive unemployment in this country? I mean, we had we had an 8% situation after 2008, you know, but people immediately remember back to the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher, the miners' strike, and all the rest of it. Again, different day, different things going on. And I think I, I had a really nice anecdotal example that one of our partners in property members was telling me about. She said, I've never dealt with uh, with any local authority tenants or anything like that. I've only ever had young professionals, right? Now, of course, the covenant at the moment of the LHA tenant is quite appealing. It's backed by the government. And if you can find the right ones, I've always advocated trying to work with LHA tenants who pass the right sort of filters because they'll stay in properties for years and years. They'll really look after them. They're good, honest people. They are where they are. But that's not all LHA tenants, unfortunately. And she said it's incredible because the mindset difference that she'd seen between people who were, there, there were people in her HMOs, they cost about 400 pounds a month a room, single people on the, the shared room rate, plus the single person's allowance, 700 pounds a month. And they were saying, well, that's all right. I've got to pay my rent. So that comes out first. That's 400 of my 700. That would fail any affordability test known to man. Um, and then I've got a bit for food. And of course I'm not going anywhere and spending any money on anything because the whole of the, the economy's locked down anyway. Um, so there's a mindset thing. And what I'm, what I'm really trying to get to is if there is a 12% unemployment situation, it's not the 12% that's the most important thing. It's the duration of that unemployment. And it, that is where the damage will be done. So there is always short term what they call frictional unemployment in the economy. And people move around and they can do um, or, or they don't move around and they do have the skills or they don't have the skills 
Now, what we've seen is we've been forced into a massively accelerated online world where we could already do all of this stuff on Zoom and we'd, we'd used Zoom before and we'd done some of the, but we never did things like this. And we've had many, many Zoom calls during, during this lockdown, Andrew, just myself and you, uh, various debates, different things. Um, and we never used it to anywhere near its full potential. I'm working from my office in the car, as you can see, um, but I've, I've been working quite happily from home where I've needed to, whereas I haven't worked from home for years, more out of choice than anything, um, but it was functional. It worked. We've got the mobile phone. We can still see each other face to face. We can still do business. And really, that's kind of a, there was a bit of a glass half full, glass half empty um, figure that came out last week, which was around the actual drop in the economy in April. And it was 20.4%. And everyone's like, oh, well, I told you all this gigantic economic damage. And the first thing I thought was, well, that meant nearly 80% of the economy still functioned with at least half of us stuck in our bedrooms or our living rooms trying to do business. That's an incredible thing. That is an incredible thing facilitated by tech and the internet. So, so we go back to unemployment and how long will it really take? Well, anecdotally, I'm mindful of being too over optimistic. And as an economist by training, that is unlikely because very few economists are remotely optimistic, let alone over optimistic. But I'm mindful of, um, of the temperature we've been talking about. And there is an element to which you can talk yourself into a recession and you can talk yourself out. And Boris is a big believer in what they call boosterism. So that is the sort of beat the chest, you know, make Great Britain great again, whatever, whatever, whatever. And that does is proven to drive spending, which is the big driver in the economy. When spending is, is ebbs away like it did during the lockdown, government spending can come in very temporarily, realistically, and pick up the slack, which is what, what some of it did. And we're going to see, I'm sure, within the next sort of six weeks, another emergency budget that will address some of the measures that are needed to really stimulate the economy. But anecdotally, I'm hearing from people around and about professional services that I deal with, other networking meetings, saying, well, we're surprised actually how much business has come back. So I think it's been quite easy, really, to be on furlough because any, well, the vast majority of businesses will tell you that their number one cost is staff. So if you completely take that cost out of the business, that's an interesting proposition. So there has been chance to sit on the sidelines and see what happens. But now we do need to really encourage people to come back to work, encourage people to spend. Now, also anecdotally, I've known a few people who have availed themselves of a few bounce back loans, who've been buying sports cars, who've been going out, not necessarily investing it, but I suppose at least it's got the economy moving, we could say. I'm not sure if I'd want to be holding too many sports cars if we do go into a deep recession, but that's a, that's a different conversation. Um, but it, it's been interesting and we'll see where HMRC target their site when the, when the division bell sounds and reckoning day comes on that side of things. But my, my, my instinct at the moment, and it is really only instinct because you can't, as I say, if you're going to look at what happened over time and when GDP went down and how much the house price market went down, you've got to put more variables into that analysis. It's just too simplistic, right? All good models and I don't mean Heidi Klum sort of models, all good models will have a number of variables. They won't have too many because too many overcomplicates things. But realistically, you're looking at four, five, six things to take into account. And just doing a couple of graphs of this and that, it's just not enough. It's not good enough. You've got to look at it in the context, in the round. Will we see these jobs come back? Well, we've been excellent at creating jobs in the UK over the last 10 years. It's something that's been under-celebrated. Um, and there's lots of pushback on that from lots of sides of the economic spectrum. But we were down in the sort of sub-4% region, um, which is a great driver for the economy. Because just look at it from the government's perspective. It moves you on the government balance sheet from a liability where they're paying you to an asset who hopefully is, is paying the government. And, of course, that's the name of the game. So it's very expensive to create jobs in the long term. And so that's one of the reasons why the furlough scheme has been so clever, in my opinion, because it has preserved some of these jobs. And I don't doubt for a second it will have saved hundreds of thousands of jobs because the friction that would have occurred otherwise, you know, the US, I think they saw 
something like approaching 25% of the workforce go unemployed temporarily. So there was, there was none of this sort of stuff. That's how they do it in the US. Sorry, fly or die, tough luck, bang, down you go. So hard that in May, they actually put on 2.3 million jobs. So this looks like the start of the recovery, notwithstanding any second waves. And uh, I don't want to go into that too deeply, but I might say that I think things have been so prevalent on the first wave and it's not over yet. I'm not sure we're in too many second wave days just because I'm not sure we're going to finish our first one at any point in the near future. Um, but it does, it does seem to me instinctively that things are a little bit greener than people thought they would be. There is growth out there as you know, it's interesting to hear Linda talk about, it's obviously not putting the developers off, even though they've got probably the toughest job of them all trying to forecast future values. So, you know, they must be doing good deals at the moment. What I know anecdotally is from people we've been talking to or people that we do business with talking to vendors and vendors come to them saying, well, I want to just cash in now, you know, it's a recession now, isn't it? So might as well sell up. They're coming with adjusted expectations. Well, that's fantastic because that means that deals will happen. Um, and if there's one thing I know, uh, or two things I know really, one is don't do the same as everybody else because there's absolutely no point. And two, when everybody thinks something is going to happen, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen. So there's many ways in which things can work themselves out. I mean, if you looked at central London and you looked at the heat that was in the market, really 2010 to 2014, it started to come off the top in Mayfair, but then 15 and then very early 16, it plateaued. Now, did we then see a big crash? No, we saw some adjustment. We saw difficulties with people who developed flats in zone one and zone two because they were being overdeveloped anyway. And any idiot, frankly, could have told you that. If you were looking at what everybody else was doing, you'd have noticed, do we need another 800 flats in zone two when we've got you know, 25,000 coming online in the next 18 months? Probably not, because there isn't that level of demand for new flats um, in zone two. So you know, it was, it was slightly foreseeable, but we didn't have a crash. We've then had some relatively flat years. Now, some of that has been Brexit related. Um, some of that has been just the way that the market adjusts when they don't do lots of transactions. Um, they tend to calm down, not do so much, and it tends to take place at a relatively suppressed level. And there are bits of London that were down 20% at certain points, but it's quite difficult to draw those parallels with, with the whole market. So we could just see a few years of relatively flat stuff going on. We could see, because of these incredibly low interest rates and the likelihood of interest rates staying very, very low for the foreseeable future, we could see that cash generating assets become more popular. Property becomes more popular in comparison to, say, shares, which have been up and down like this this year. Whereas the beautiful thing about property is if you don't need to crystallize and you've got, say, financing on it or you own it in cash, you haven't actually crystallized the loss and you've still got the asset that generates the money. Um, that you haven't necessarily seen and won't see from, from your average share price. So there's more attractiveness there. Gold seems relatively expensive. Um, bricks and mortar always works for people in the UK. I don't think our obsession has gone away. If anything, the lockdown has proved that when the golden scissors came out, everybody went mad and tried to go out and buy stuff. And I, I mean, we were predicting that, you know, 30% of deals would fall through. 50% of deals might fall through, just hasn't happened, hasn't happened. 10% of deals have fallen through. Um, and when they have, they tended to resell again pretty quickly. So I think at some point we'll see a, 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 a redress of this balance between demand and supply and more stuff will start to come to the market. Um, but there's still so many variables that are going on. I personally think that the, the, your bread and butter stock, your good, honest income generating, and that might relate to, what Linda said in terms of commercial to resi conversions, one bed flats, good bread and butter stuff, maybe a bit smaller than you would normally do if you're developing, because it's not a good time to overextend yourself. I don't think anybody would think it is. Um, but that stuff could easily hold up in terms of values, in terms of rents. Rents could go up because rents were very robust in the last recession. You know, we can't take too much of this stuff for granted. What I wouldn't be doing personally is going out on a limb and building eight detached executive homes, um, because I think that might be a part of the market that might suffer, because that 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 piece where um, companies will look to make redundancies or make cost savings 
could hit the sort of middle class, upper middle class a little bit. But I agree with what Sam said earlier around build to rent and its attractiveness. It looks ever more attractive in this environment because ultimately all you've got to do is make sure you're standing up at the end and you've got a product that you can rent at a fair price. And realistically, more divorces thanks to lockdown. It's like five Christmases rolled into one. More people needing accommodation. Will it put people off coming into the UK? That's probably a big factor. I think yes, temporarily, but in the long term, absolutely no way. Because the NHS has absolutely covered itself in glory throughout the whole thing. And for those of us who don't really realise what people think of the UK outside of the UK, you know, it's been an international phenomenon of how well we've looked after people versus if you look at what's happened in the States and you know what happens to healthcare there and outcomes for people who can't afford health insurance, it's a, it's a different kettle of fish altogether. So I think, although we, our figures maybe don't look great at the moment, um, we'll probably in the round look reasonably good in the long run. And I'm not, I'm not overly convinced that if you're sitting on the sidelines waiting for a 20% drop, let me know how you get on. We'll have a chat in 12 months. I'll suspect you won't have done anything. Um, I think there's always good deals out there at any time. So you might have to work a bit harder for them at the moment, but it's well worth putting that work in. We may see something at the end of the year around October to December time, but the market tends to quieten down then anyway. But this isn't a normal year. You know, we've had, we've lost 10 weeks of transactions already. Nobody can go abroad really with any certainty in, July and August. So will summer be quiet? Probably not. Um, but then uh, when winter time comes around, let's see what's happening in the flu season. Let's see what else is going on. But I'm feeling a bit more upbeat than I've been feeling in general without being uh, over optimistic, I think. With that, Andrew, I'll, I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, that was uh, one heck of a whirlwind on what is happening, what has been happening, and what is likely to happen. And there's been some interesting comments come in. Robert has said, uh, just to correct you, Adam, rockets are more engineering-based than science-based. So, you know... I told you I was no good at physics. There you go. That's, that proves the point. Absolutely. I was sitting here myself when I read that comment, and I'm going, it's more like being on with James... Corden in karaoke carpool. So I was just waiting for Sia to jump in the passenger seat and start uh, hollowing some songs out with you. That would be welcome at any time if Sia's watching. That would be fantastic. Likewise. <laughs> so, I mean, to, to sort of pick on a couple of things that Adam said there, I mean, the furlough has kept a lot of companies going. It's took the staff off payroll. If we were to look at a company like Primark, it's basically got rid of one of their largest costs and then companies like Primark have also taken out rent deferrals which has wiped out almost all the costs so all they've lost is the profit on the margin of the goods and they're almost better off because then they've got the business rates grants and all the other stuff that's come in the companies are doing well albeit that they lost 60 million of uh, sales a month and I was talking to somebody this afternoon and we can't really compare this to an auction, uh, sorry, to, to um, any other previous recession. It's more like a World War I or World War II, where we're carrying on as best as we can, but we're in a sort of controlled lockdown environment. So I, I do agree with you, Adam. Now, we've had quite a lot of questions coming in. If you've got more questions, drop them in the box below. What I'm going to do is sort of pick on the questions and try and answer everybody's questions as we go through. Now, the first question actually goes uh, to Linda. And is there a place I can go to find all of the permitted development rules and regulations? And I know that we're in a, a conversation on this particular topic, but what would you advise on that one for, for Erin? I was going to say, do you want to unmute me? But I've done it myself. Um, Sorry. To be honest, no, there isn't one. Well, there is. It's called the General Permitted Development England Order for England or for Wales. And, and that has, it's 164 pages. So if you're an insomniac, knock yourselves out. Um, 
it yes it's all there it's all set out in the general permitted development order but interpreting it and getting it right because it, it it starts off with this is permitted and you think oh wow that's fabulous and then it goes ah but and then it says this isn't permitted if you do this it's not permitted if it exceeds that if it's not permitted if it's taller than this it's not permitted so it's it's all written in the negative because legislation has to be um but it's it's very very difficult it's, it's a it's a maze to work your way through so yes to answer the question in its simplistic form it is all written down in the regulations in the development management procedure there's several different sets of regulations that it's in so yes but it depends it's oh, planning is a weird thing it's not just about taking the regulations and applying it to a sterilized um building or piece of land because every single piece of land will be different and everything for permitted development rights for example you can do that with single dwellings and you can put extensions on and all sorts of things but with changes of use again it depends on the use of the building how long it's been used for the building it depends on whether it's a listed building not if it's in a conservation area because that's fine whether it's near a military explosives area there's all sorts of so actually to say ah oh, yes i can just put a tick in that box and we're fine to go you can't the, the planning Planning is horrendously complicated. And one of the things that the government's trying to do this year is to uncomplicate it. But I, I fear for their sanity, to be honest. So yes, it's all written down in regulations. You have to know it is not simple and you have to know how to apply it. And every site, every building and every piece of land will be different. And then every council will be different as well. Well, that sounds a little bit like tax, Linda. Every year they say we're going to simplify tax and every year it gets more complicated. So accountants are kept in a job. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that this is how planning consultants are being kept in a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, actually, not planning consultants generally, me. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got to keep you in a job. Brilliant answer. And I think... What I would also add, Linda, is it's worth people subscribing to this channel. And that's not a plug for this channel. Yes, it's, it Linda has some briefs coming soon. Sorry, uh, planning briefs, I, I meant to say, coming I soon. Call them planning pants. Planning pants, yeah. <laughs> Never mind, we were going to call them planning shorts because they were going to be short 10, 15 minute explanations. Then I found that um, a firm of um, QCs and barristers had put out something, number five chambers had put out something that said, oh, planning shorts. And they've got a little pair of shorts and all these. And I thought, I, I sent a, a, a message to Andrew and I went, damn. And then he said, oh, it's all right, we'll call them planning briefs. And I said, well, no, they should have called theirs planning briefs because they are. So I've now decided I don't want to call it planning briefs. I want to call it planning pants. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the graphic for the, this YouTube icon here. Big pants. <laughs> yeah. Big girl Bridget Jones pants. <laughs> so if you want to get involved and you want Linda and I to share with you our walkthrough of that planning directory in a real world scenario with case, not case studies, working examples of how it'll work subscribe to the channel now but uh, that that's not a plug for anything other than linda is phenomenal and fantastic so i've got a question here for you sam and the, the question is how does a development finance lender see an investor or a developer if they're using a creative strategy i.e they, they've tied up an option and the asset owner is depositing the property as collateral and they want to convert an office to residential now not not really a, a 30 second uh, 
answer to that one. I'm trying to unmute you, but it's not. Oh, there you there go. You go. Unmuted yourself. Yeah, it's did, not really a thirty-second you... answer, but you you get the drift. Somebody is effectively using a third party to deposit the asset in, and they want to raise development finance on that. Yeah. Have you not lifted the value taking Linda's advice? Well, number one, Adam, can you stop putting uh, questions in the uh, in the YouTube thing, please? <laughs> <laughs> try, stop trying to catch me out. Um, do you know what? I think there's a really long answer to that, and there's probably a shorter answer to that. So I'll go with a shorter answer just to spare everyone. Um, the key in anything like this is visibility, and can you get a lender to make sense of it? Because if they can make sense of it, then they're more likely to say yes. If they can find a uh, uh, an explanation and, un and understand it, that's number one. And number two is, no matter how you're buying a property, no matter what you're doing to it, no matter what st structures you've got in place, there is one thing a development lender cares about more than anything, how they're gonna get their money back. So start with that, show them very, very clearly how they're gonna get their money back within the term that they have set you or within the term that you've set yourself. Um, and you can pretty much make other things work. With those kind of structures and there's third parties and all sorts of other bits and pieces, you know, you're probably not gonna be going to your sort of more mainstream high street bridging development lenders. Um, but certainly the more, uh, trying to think of a nice word to, or not, not, not detrimental to other lenders, um, this, those that maybe have been in the game a bit longer um you're more likely to to have to to use those and those unfortunately usually mean um that maybe sophisticated was the word i was going to use but again that's quite detrimental maybe to other lenders those that have been in the game a while they're probably going to require that the minimum loan sizes are going to be a bit higher you know maybe quarter of a mil and above maybe half a mil and above maybe even a mil and above um and they're going to want to probably see that maybe you've got some form of experience of doing this kind of thing before as well. So it's not necessarily the structure per se, it's what goes around it. Um, and this is what a lot of people miss when it comes to development funding, is uh, it's the big picture. It's the entire thing and how it all comes together. So I'm not sure if I answered that all right. <laughs> No, I think you you certainly have covered the answer on that. And and basically, it's start with the end in mind. It would be to summarise what yeah, you just that's, said. That's there. literally my favourite phrase. Yeah. Yeah, I use that so every I, single day. I think that's brilliant. Now, a, a question here for Adam, if he unmutes himself. Um, we've got a pandemic, and it's interesting to hear that you feel it's a seller's market due to the government intervention. Do you think that will reverse and become a buyer's market at some time? And this question's coming from Srini, uh, and he's sort of saying, if you, if you do think it will become a buyer's market, when do you think? Six months, 12 months, 18 months before it sort of shifts? You know, if I was pretty, I mean, you, you mentioned the falling knife earlier, Andrew, didn't you? And that is the, the fear of everybody. But I would go back to the point that we could have been sitting on the sidelines for the last four years. In fact, to be honest, you can find a reason to sit on the sidelines at all times um, if you look hard enough, especially with the way the world is these days. So I think if there's fundamentally an imbalance between supply and demand, which is what I've partially been talking about earlier on, then there's a reason to believe that that will flip flop for no reason other than things naturally working their way out and, you know, a reversion to the mean effectively. So at some point there will be more supply. And, and I'll tell you where I've seen examples of that sort of thing, which seem ridiculous, but they're really not. So take a, uh, a smaller city in the UK, which maybe has two auction houses that are of any note. That quite often happens. Now, about once a year, they often have a, a, a week where they'll both have an auction. They don't normally, they normally stay away from each other, but there'll be a point, usually somewhere before summer holidays where everybody wants to go away, where they'll both have an auction. And if you go to the one on the Monday, then you'll find that it's very buoyant, people picking up projects and all the rest of it. And if you go to the one on the Tuesday, you'll quite often find that people on the Monday spent the money and they're in the room and stuff sells much more cheaply on the Tuesday. And that really shouldn't happen 
with assets that are worth hundreds of thousands of pounds, but it does. Um, there are always parts of the year that are more quiet. I have a, there, there was a really interesting phenomenon that someone mentioned the other day, and I don't know whether there's been a phrase coined for it or not, but I made a comment um, on the back of it. So there is a, there was a phenomenon in the, because there's been a lot of talk about the Spanish flu when we go back to the 19, 1918 to 1920, and that's where some of the prevailing logic at the moment is coming from. And obviously the world was different 100 years ago, and the amount of information we've got was very different. But the, the 19, when, when things ended in 1920, it was cited as one of the reasons as to why the 20s were known as the Roaring Twenties. And we had a big boom before, of course, we had a big crash at the Great Depression in 1929. And it wasn't all fueled by credit. Some of it was fueled by people spending money, consumption, which is what fuels any good boom. And the thoughts were, they call it revenge spending. Or that, or that sort of phenomenon where they say, well, bugger this, I've been locked down for 12 weeks. I'm not having this anymore. I'm not able to go to my favourite restaurant. I'm not able to do this. The government's telling me I've got to do this. Like Linda says, they've got to tell me I've got to wear a mask on public transport. Not that it bothers Linda because she wouldn't be seen dead on public transport. But nonetheless, they're telling, that you know, I'm not, I'm not having this. A lot of people, I think, probably feel that they haven't made the most out of the last three months of their life. I think it'd be fair to say. I've heard some people say, it's like they've been stolen from me. Um, and I can understand that. We, we live in a free country. We're very, very lucky. We're used to our civil liberties. We're used to all of that sort of thing. So there is an element to which you could lift the lid off and then people could spend quite hard. Now, ultimately, people can't spend if their employment and their employers are not holding up. So we come back to the, the original point around where employment is going to land or not. And I think just by definition... You know, and we, we've been talking quite a lot about sentiment tonight and how that feeds what people do. Just by definition, we know that, say, a million of the people on the furlough scheme, plus or minus a few hundred thousand, are probably going to lose their jobs. We don't know how temporary or not that is, as we said, but we know that there's going to be headlines about that plastered across the mainstream media telling us, oh, this is it. No one has ever lost so many jobs in one week. This has happened. That's happened. And that might be a point where sentiment does start to dip. And we've already seen, if you, if you graphed it, it'd be really interesting this year. If you graphed, if you just pick one, I'm pick on the Daily Mail, because why not? Everyone picks on the Daily Mail. So let's pick on them, because they knock out the most content, realistically. And they've got one of the number one news sites on the internet, whether you agree with it or not. That's, that's the fact in terms of how many hits they get. Did you say Daily had, Mail, Adam? Yeah, they, so if I, you look at the, I'm just getting the key words in here on, on the uh, uh, subtitle. <laughs> they have more hits than the New York Times, Andrew, rightly or wrongly. That's what happens. So Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they, I they have Telegraph come, Independent while we're there. Go for it. <laughs> they have come out with all... I've seen all spectrums of the headlines in the last two or three months from housing market in the doldrums, right move listings up 78 percent it's like well of course they are there was no one listing houses last week you know or everything on the spectrum so let's see how the temperature changes in the daily mail and the mainstream media and that may well talk people into much more of a seller and there are people at the moment i'm i'm sure 20 30 percent of the population who are still somewhat fearful of the virus maybe they're in a particular risk category um Maybe they've just let the news get to them realistically over the last three months. Now, they may be holding off thinking, well, I'll wait and see what happens. And then if things do start to slide and then motivation starts to kick in because suddenly some of the credit card lenders and the, the Wongas or uh, they're not around anymore, but the, the remnants of those guys of the world are kicking in and suddenly do start to put pressure on people to repay loans. That's when motivation will be out. And that's when things will come to the market. So changes in circumstances always generate trading activity in the property market. And even if you lose your job in October and you get another one in November or January, you know, three months would not be a long time to be out of work, generally speaking, in a situation like this. But if, if that timing coincides with when the days are getting shorter and it's winter and the market tends to slow down anyway, we could see people this year think, well, bugger this, I'm going to have the best Christmas I've ever had. Because I'm sick of I'm sick of being I'm kept indoors, and the pubs are open, so there's something to celebrate, you know. And that might mean that there, there is there is less in terms of investment activity. People do take their eye off the ball a bit, 
but there is supply and there's real good. I mean, I'm a big fan of buying in December. I'm always a big fan of buying in December and I try and work as close to the bone as I can uh, and still stay married realistically because there are some great op- post about the 12th when everyone else is off to Dubai and I'm jealous of them, but still grafting hard. Um, I've picked up some spectacular deals and I don't see any reason why this year won't, won't be any different on that front as well. So just, just remember sentiment versus fundamentals. But if you're, if you're waiting until everybody starts getting miserable, September to December this year, you know, specifically October, November, when, when furlough really starts to bite, that's when we'll see some stuff happen. I'd agree with you, Adam. I, I'm thinking quarter four myself is when you will start to see the impacts there. Um, fantastic answer. And I think you've really gone to town on that one. Um, a, a question for Linda here. Now, I hope you've got your uh, technical hat on here, Linda, because there's, there's some technical questions for you and Sam that have really come through. How many dwellings can you build using prior approval under class M, the rear of a shop? How many dwellings can you build at the rear of a shop using class M? What? Um, class M, there's, there's no limit. It's, it's, not, it's not about the number of units. It's about what under class M, which is a hybrid, prior, it's another one of these hybrid prior approvals um, where it's, it tends to be um, a shop in an area where you can, um, it's, it's not like the office to residential. Um, it's not about the numbers. It's, and I, I suspect this person has a particular site in mind. It's about what reasonably sized units can you get in there? What about the corridors? What about the stairs? What about the access? Because lots of people look at the floor plan, they completely forget about the stairs, the communal areas, the places that you actually need to get up the floors to. So a lot of people will look at uh, prior approvals and say, ah, well, we can just put studio units in there. And, and yes, councils can't really uh, can't really refuse prior approvals on the basis of the size of a studio or a one bedroom flat if it's a prior approval application. But I've seen some drawings where somebody was trying to fit a studio into an internal terrace property and there were no windows. And you think, what the hell do you think you're trying to build? You cannot do, this is cave dwelling. You cannot do this. So it's about the, oh, the cat. The cat makes an appearance. Yeah. All right, we don't want to see the bum. Oh, no, put it away. Um, oh, uh. There's always wildlife when Linda's on. There's always wildlife. <laughs> yes, yeah, some, some wilder than others, but there we go. Let, let me ask a question then. Plus M, uh, I mean, this is, hasn't come through from the question, but this is my understanding. Under Class M, yeah. you're restricted. Let me use the word restricted, and you perhaps put a better word in there, to 150 square metres. Yeah, which is not going to get you a lot, which is why I'm talking about yeah. space. And lots of, I, I have a slide on, on my presentations that I specifically say this. A lot of people's, people quite conveniently forget about it and go, there, we can put six slats in here. Well, no, actually, you can't. Well, you might be able to, but there'll be, you know, people living in cupboards. So yeah. yes, you have to look at all of the conditions of class M. Um, and it, it literally, it does depend on how much floor space, but, but be aware that councils can refuse these. You can't do them in primary shopping frontages. So don't think you're going to go and do this kind of thing next door to Marks and Spencers. Although, quite honestly, the way things are going, Marks and Spencers might actually be up for sale to do this type of thing with. So, um, you know, so it, you've got to, you can't just look at, oh, Class M, I can convert to residential. Read the entire paragraph 
in the general committee development order and see, as you've just said, see what the limitations are. Would we call it class M and S, Linda, if we did that, rather than class M? Sorry? Would we call it class M and S? No, S and M, darling. <laughs> uh, you see, don't we mess can rely on Linda. We can rely on Linda. <laughs> now, now, the thing I would say, Linda, is you must have been looking at the Allsops auction catalogue because in this month's June auction Allsops catalogue, M and S, Buxton, Derbyshire is for sale. And it's a huge, monstrous building. So there you go. Well done, Linda. Thank you led us straight into that one. That's class M, are you? Because it's too big. It is too big. It's way too big. Yeah. So I've got a question for you, Sam, if uh, you could unmute yourself. Now, that this I'm one... I'm good for a wine. Yeah, th this one's a technical one for you as well. Um, th this is coming from Srini, and he said he's considering moving his buy-to-let portfolio into an LLP structure, and because he doesn't have a partner, it's going to be a mixed partnership structure. So a limited stop company... the cat from interrupting for a second time. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> a limited company structure with a, a, a living individual. So a mixed partnership structure is what that means. There. Okay. Uh, but he's worried whether he will be able to secure mortgage finance or refinance the properties which he's got, which uh, are on fixed rates at the moment when he comes off them. Yeah, so, let's try and get the cats. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not helping. Will he have a problem raising finance in a mixed partnership structure, or is that something that you would be able to help him with? Um. LLPs, and I, I had this conversation with a client earlier on, LLPs are the most difficult. If you if you look at the three basic structures, sole ownership, LLP, and limited company, LLP is the most difficult to fund. It's the fewest options for lending, simple as that. So as soon as you get into that sort of part, then you're going to limit yourself. It may well be that you're limited to more commercially minded lenders, which can mean slightly higher interest rates. Um, when you complicate it further, Again, you restrict your lending base. And this is why I say to, to clients all the time, they say, can I do X, Y, and Z plus this, plus that, one, two, and three? And I say, yeah, of course you can. I said, but there's probably only two lenders out there that will do it. So it's the luck of the draw right now. If they're really cheap, great. If they're not, you're in trouble. Um, and I had a client in, in a very similar sort of way just to, just to prove the methodology. I had a client come to me recently um, and Adam, you might have known who put, put this client in my direction, actually. Um, they were looking to buy a property that they wanted to rent out for social housing. And um, they had never owned a property before, even their own main residence. Um, and they also wanted to rent this property out as a six bedroom HMO. So I said, OK, so you don't have a main residence. So in terms of a risk assessment, lenders are going to go, haven't really got a track record of paying a mortgage previously. They, um, you also want to rent the property out as an HMO with lo no letting experience whatsoever. That's another massive risk. You also then want to rent this out on a five-year lease to a social housing company, um, which is not really what the market, the, the more mainstream mortgage market likes anyway. And I said, let me let me put, put the tables back on you, Mr. Mr. Client. Do you think you deserve a mortgage? And he said, well, now you put it that way. And uh, I said, well, well, there you go then. I said, we've got about three lenders that will do that, but we'll, it's going to start at around five and a half, six percent. Um, but actually, I mean, he, he, when, he, when I said six percent, he sort of buggered off. But, um, <laughs> um, but actually, looking at the figures on something like that, it, it, it still worked and it cash flowed. And once he actually did have two years of experience, we could have refinanced him on something better and then he would have had the asset. So going back to your original question in terms of, trickiness of these kinds of things um a lot of people will get put off by um, interest rates because of um on, on the short term they look at their cash flow and i know adam's quite a big uh, fan of this they look at their monthly cash flow and they want to sack their boss they want to be financially free but actually the interest rate isn't isn't what's stopping you from doing that it's your inability to think long term and to think actually that money that those properties are generating are not there to pay my electricity bill and they're not there to pay for me taking the wife out for a dinner. They're there to, to, to keep, reinvest, reinvest, you know, de 
deleverage that sort of thing um and so that's a mindset thing so actually going back to your your original um situation um there's going to be lending available for that situation 100 it's whether the interest rate that you're going to be able to achieve on that is conducive to it being a decent deal at the end of the day and if it is then actually the interest rate is completely irrelevant yeah well uh, that's a great answer and the what i would probably Put, not put a spin on it, but but sort of add to what you've just said there, Sam, is if you're considering incorporating the portfolio and you have to go through this stepping stone of the LLP to get to the limited company where the more preferential rates lie and the lower tax bands lie, it might be worth looking at the portfolio now, remortgaging, then taking the LLP step while you're on a three to five year fix and then stepping out of it at the other side on the... Yeah. The we had a, we, you know, we had a, a sort of big, big influx of this type, these type of inquiries when um, obviously all the announcements were made about the changes in tax a, a few years ago. And effectively, it, 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 it's a relatively simple situation for us as, as brokers. It was a great opportunity to get more clients actually because these were things that people weren't used to which is effectively deleveraging and then re-leveraging so you're you're and sometimes there is a period in between so effectively there might even be two transactions out of it depending on how you do it the one the one thing that i would say in in terms of that particular structure is that i i mean no, bear in mind i'm not a tax advisor uh and and you know, I, I'm not qualified to give tax advice. This is just advice that I've been given from various different tax sources. Is that actually at what point you know you could actually become a bit of an LLP? Um, you can kind of be imprisoned by the LLP um, structure if HMRC decides to make changes again in the future. So yes, at the moment all's well, and you can go through this particular structure, and we can find your finance for each individual part as well. But it's a tricky thing to be looking at long term, because as we know, changes can happen like that and you could become prisoner, not a prisoner of the, uh, of the LMP. That's what I was trying to say is, you know, and, and then you're stuck in that bit where I'm saying, yeah, do you know what? If you can hang on for a few years with a higher interest rate and actually it's OK, that's great. But what if you're trapped there long term? And actually, the tax breaks that you were hoping to achieve by you know, following this structure actually don't then materialise. You're kind of getting hit twice. So, um, yeah, look, it, it, it's it's hard. It's tricky. Um, and often I tend, I, I've seen, um, I know you guys have sort of been around this industry a lot longer than me, so you've probably seen it even more so. But there often tends to be um sometimes situations that are too good to be true and if we see certain bodies going back on what they've said and, and start weeding yeah. out certain people uh, and that that this could be something that happens here not saying it will but it could brilliant well i've got a couple of thank yous coming in for you sam uh sam says thank you very much uh callie said you've made her day the cat intervention was fantastic um, she, she, she later says, uh, sorry, I'm a sucker for cats. I have enjoyed this, the other two speakers too. So. <laughs> can, I, can I just, a quick, quick thing on the cats is that, um, to, and this just shows how dedicated I am to you, Andrew, is today um, Mrs. Norris and I actually picked up our third cat and she's about this big and she's currently in the other room getting cuddles off of off of my wife and uh, and i really want to be in there too but i'm here doing this with you so just just wanted to just show my dedication to the cause you know <laughs> my love for you sir my love for you and respect um, i'm a dog person uh, so so am i but we you can't really have a dog in cats can you say so. <laughs> i'm a dog person cats are so indifferent most of the time. I know, that's what I love about them. Uh, I, 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 I want a dog that comes at you and jumps all over you and wags tail. Old English sheepdog, can't be. <laughs> Loving it. Well, well, we started. <laughs> we, we've got a comment here from Susan for you, Adam, which says she's really enjoyed your insightful thoughts and the summary of the past couple of months. And 
she would rather listen to you than any of the news channels that are on TV. Could you actually start your own news channel, please, Adam, so that you can inspire the population? You, you're those, just like those, I say. You all talk those the spare economy hours I've got in the day, again. Andrew. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> it's it's very. I think the thing is, I've had some great, really, really good comments over the last few because I've spent a lot of time and effort into trying to work out what's going on, not out of pure self-interest, just out of raw distrust for the way that the media has generally put a spin on things and I've tried to share what I found out in a very no-nonsense kind of way because that's very much my style um, and I've had some great comments about it but the sad thing is I think if you probably did a poll you'd probably find that for every one person who enjoyed a, a, a truthful summary of really what's going on in the world there'd be a hundred people who prefer to see Sam's little kitten that he's just described who sounds so cute um, and that, that's the reality of social media. So I really appreciate I really appreciate the comments, and I do try to uh, I do try and uh, and give it out straight and put a I try to do a, an article once a week on the Facebook UK Property Traders Group about what's going on in property and what I'm seeing because I do get you know I'm privy to quite a lot of conversations with active property traders, as you said, agencies, all all of that sort of stuff. So. I've got relative sort of finger to the pulse on that stuff. But also, I'm interested in what's true. I'm not interested in saying things to sell courses or do things or anything like that. I'm interested in what's true because I think that is what is ultimately going to benefit all of us. And we might exactly. not like that conversation sometimes. And you could pick a number of examples in the last month where we really wouldn't have liked that conversation. It'd be really awkward. Um, but ultimately, that is where we need to be at in order to to go forward as a society. In a society where we're either seem to be going down the Marxist communist route or down the authoritarian totalitarian fascist route, I'm pretty keen to try and stay in the middle because I quite like it in the middle. It's quite nice. It's quite cool. I quite like that. So um, yeah. that, that's where that's where I try to be a disagreeable person in the centre. <laughs> Well, no, what I would say is if you're not a friend of Adam's or a follower of Adam's, because I'm sure he's maxed out on his friends, I would certainly go follow him because he puts out some really great, uh, I would almost call them sort of researched reports once a week. They're almost like a dissertation from a university, cross-referencing and very strategic and he's a person to follow and a person to take note of here in my personal and professional opinion we, we've got time for just two more questions i've got a hopefully a quick one here because i i think you i know what linda's possibly going to say on this um linda i've got an x a1 unit and it's had a change of use to a D1. Can I still use uh, PD to split back the back of the unit to a flat? I'm not sure what a temporary PD means. So what I believe the person is saying is they've got a shop. It was an A1 use. It's been converted to a D1, but they want to basically use the rights that originally were on the A1 use and convert the back to a flat. Does that make sense? It does, yes, no. I thought that might be a quick answer. Well, and it's, it's down I mean, to its you current use. use. Planning permission for D1, you've used it, it, it has been used by a previous A another person. It's a D1. You yeah. ain't got no permitted development rights. Because they have to have been in place in March, 20th no, 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 of March, no, no, no. 2013, isn't it? And they've lost them. No, no, no. That's just for office to residential. Permitted development rights is nothing about this. So you could have, I'm sorry, I'm shouting now. It's, I've, I've, I've had a glass and a half, half of red wine and I'm shouting. But no, no, no. That um, 2013 is just for office to residential. So let's park that. Right. Permitted development rights are a nationally conferred right, as we know, for all properties, unless 
the council choose to remove permitted development rights for whatever reason with an Article 4 direction. Right, and they can do this for office to residential properties as well. So don't forget that. It's not just about HMOs. It's for office to residentials in certain areas. So you've got to be careful. But with this one, if you have an A1 shop, it's had planning permission to go to D1. It's been converted to D1. Okay. It loses all, well, there are some permitted development rights, but very limited some temporary uses and it's very limited. If you, if you then got planning permission to take it back to an A1 and used it as, and used it and implemented that consent and used it as an A1, as a shop for however long, then it starts to have the permitted, but it has to be planning permission, use it, and then it has permitted development rights again. But if it's still in D1 use, you haven't got the permitted development rights to go and put the residential and use class M. Just, just doesn't work like that. And we need, when we do this series, we need to specifically explain about the use classes order and the classes in the, in the GDPO. So, because people get confused with that. So, no, the answer is you can't. I don't like giving um, advice on a, on a site-specific issue because there can be a little bit of information that I don't know about, and it can be wrong. It's a bit like the financials. It's a bit like the due diligence when you do when you go to auctions. There can be a little hinky bit in there that I don't know about. But generally, the general answer is if it's D1, it's D1. Ain't got no permitted development rights. Yeah. Thank you very much, Linda. Now, talking due diligence, um, Adam, do you want to unmute yourself? I believe you are um, doing a due diligence talk on Wednesday night. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. So we're running a, so COVID has taught us one thing about partners in property. We definitely want to have an online event that goes on beyond when we can get back to face to face, we're going to love that. But we definitely want to keep an online event because it's brought all members of our community who stretch from Scotland to Singapore these days. It's brought them together and we, we can't do that without the Internet. So we're trying to do a themed um, PIP digital meet once a month. It's on the, the third Wednesday, which obviously this Wednesday is. And our theme for this month is due diligence. So we've got a member um, who very sadly uh, as is owed over five hundred thousand pounds by a well-known guru. Um, I won't spoil the, uh, the the surprise, but Ed is going to do what most people don't do and speak very openly and honestly about exactly what he did, why he did it, and what he's learned from it. And I think that's a really brave thing to do, and I I, I applaud him for doing that. And I've said to people, you know, years ago, certainly I've lost money, not as much money, granted. Um, but I've lost money in similar sorts of situations, you know, and that's been from even with reasonable due diligence skills, um, probably should have applied a bit more of the, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. But in my situation, um, I actually ended up, it, it was a bit of an epiphany for me because I ended up working out exactly how to do it myself and then have done it myself for the years in the interim. But I think people sometimes are, frightened to speak out um don't want to look stupid um have signed ndas and are tied up in all sorts of legal agreements quite often um and and really there's also there's some really bad advice that goes on about due diligence and what you should do at company's house and some of the stuff i see i just think but that's so wrong that's wrong. what are you what are you talking about and some of the very wealthiest people that i know have very little footprint on company's house um, and you also need to to bear that sort of thing in mind. So we're going to talk about I'm going to talk specifically about myth busting. Um, we've got people coming at it from different angles in terms of due diligence of funding deals, due diligence of investing in other developers projects. There have been a couple of very high profile incidents, let's call them in the last 12 months. And let's face it, if we went back the last 12 years, there'd be high profile incidents we could refer to. 
Um, and over the next 12 years, there'll be more high profile incidents we can refer to. So what we're hoping to do is to stop some of the people, make some of the mistakes that we've made um, and learn those lessons without having to spend the money. Uh, because I see, you know, a, a compressed yield environment for the next decade, realistically. And if people are chasing 10% returns and 15% returns and even 30% returns, uh, they're going to have to understand some of the risks that they're going to have to be taking to do that. And they're going to have to go in. All we want is people to go in with their eyes wide open. You know, those returns can be achieved if you're taking the commensurate amount of risk with the right people. They can, but understand what you're doing and don't just go for the shark in the suit style approach, I suppose. So it's Wednesday at 6 p.m., Andrew, and I'll, I'll pop the link in the chat as uh, as to our website and everything. Perfect. Thank you for that. No, that's that's great. Well, I'll follow up with you on that afterwards uh, because I'm I'm doing something with John Corey and Karen Young, and and possibly involve Sam as well in this. Regards that particular topic as well, uh, where I've been approached over the last couple of weeks by over a dozen people who've had things go sour on them and due diligence is, is a really key topic and what we're doing is uh, a series on if you're an investor or if you're a borrower things that you should be doing and I think you and I think very alike and I think there's an, an area for collaboration there to actually spread that word out there and get it to people and protect the industry and Im improve the quality of the industry so um, Quick, quick question that's come on. Uh, will this recording uh, be on YouTube when it's finished? Because uh, a lot of people miss the very, very start. Uh, yeah, if you hit the subscribe button, what will happen when this goes live? It'll appear in the YouTube feed. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, Linda and I are doing a, a series on planning pants. <laughs> that will be an interesting one to watch. And again, we've got Sam, uh, who we're doing a series on finance, pants, pants shorts, uh, finance knowledge base, covering the world of finance with my sort of uh, input to help from being inside a mortgage lender, Sam being a broker, both of us being investors, and both of us being very solution orientated to solving problems. So you've got all of those to look forward to. And we've got an event on the 29th of June where John, Corey, Karen Young, myself, possibly Adam and Sam might join us on that one, looking at the due diligence and how we can um, improve what we're doing. So absolutely fantastic. And all that remains for me to say is thank you very much to the panel. You've been amazing. You're a stellar panel. I couldn't have picked a better one myself. And it's been a pleasure to have you all here <laughs> joining us. And, and all that remains, I, I think we've all got to get our levers and put Linda in the back, haven't we? So shall we go for it, guys? <laughs> I don't thank think she deserves much, that, Andrew. That's, a, that's a bit mean, but thank you for having us. It's been a, it's been a blast. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you and, Andrew. and we look forward to you all joining us again on a regular basis. You could you could always do finance frillies. No oh. finance frillies. I love that. On that note, <laughs> on that bombshell. We'll say <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, guys. See you. Pleasure. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.